this hope and previous hopes, I think they're great. I have a couple of copies, which I'll pass around so you guys can flip through it. But what I want to talk to you today about, let me get this thing higher, uh, is some fun stuff I've learned in the last year in the kitchen. And we've got a few things to pass out as well, so you get some treats and goodies to take home. And we're also going to do an experiment or two with uh, audience, participa ah, audience participation. Can't say that today. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's not working. Great. Um, I'll be a minute while I figure out why it's not working. Hold on. We'll get there. It shows the display. It's just not not displaying. Yay! Yay. Do you have birthday karma magic? Okay, so I will get the slides up. In the meantime, I'm going to tell you what's in the box because I'm going to hand these out. Um, these are little kits, I'll get to them in a minute, but what you want is one for every other person in the audience because there are actually two test strips in each of these kits and I only have 50 bags and there look like more than 50 people in here. So again, pass out. There's no difference between the two different types. They just, one's cooler looking. Oh, can you hand can you hand Okay, cool. I'm gonna move this too so I can actually see the screen. So hi, I'm Jeff Potter, author of Cooking for Geeks. Um, books I will pa hand around later so you can see what it looks like. That's my friend Carl. Um, I went to college with him. He's a really cool guy and he actually is the first person who showed me this whole concept called sous vide cooking. I heard one awesome. Does anyone else here know what sous vide cooking is? Oh, I like you guys. Okay, so that's an egg that's been cooked sous vide. Um, basically, when you cook an egg this way, it, it gets this amazing texture where the egg yolk and the egg white have kind of the same texture. It's kind of plastic, kind of like mayonnaise. Tastes amazingly good. Uh, here is a little video of me like cracking an egg that's been cooked this way, just so you can see how they kind of come out of the shell. Um, the really cool thing about them from a cooking point of view is that you cook the egg, you crack it, and it kind of drops out. You don't have to do this whole like you know trying to scoop a soft boiled egg out of the shell type thing. Um, and it, it's magic. It just kind of works really, really well. And there's this question of, well, why is that? When it comes to uh, an egg, you know, there are different proteins in the egg. And the egg begins to cook at different temperatures. And there's this really, really narrow band where eggs are like perfectly cooked. Below that, they're raw and runny. Above that, they're overcooked. And that band's 144 to 158. When you drop an egg into boiling water, you can kind of imagine that egg getting warmer and warmer and warmer, and eventually, you know, it overcooks. And if you take a hard-boiled egg and you let it just, you know, sit in water, it's completely, well, it's completely cooked. Um, and you can actually overcook it. You know, they're still good, but they're not this, like, ideal, amazing egg. So the question is, you know, how do you actually get that nice texture of an egg? You know, when we do a soft-boiled egg, you drop it in, you pull it out after about five, seven minutes, you know, whatever it is kind of trying to catch it on that blue curve as it runs up before it gets too hot. But what if there are a way to actually cook an egg where it couldn't overcook? Where you actually cook it in an environment that isn't above 158. And that's kind of the main principle of sous vide cooking. Um, one uses a water bath um, and there's a piece of electronic equipment called an immersion recirculator that basically keeps that water bath at a particular temperature. This is something that's kind of pulled out of the chemistry world where they need to do particular experiments or whatever at, at a controlled temperature. And in the 1970s, actually, this French dude figured out, hey, I can take this into the kitchen and do some interesting stuff with that and repurposed chemistry equipment to actually working in the kitchen. And if you think about it, cooking's really nothing more than chemical and physical changes in food. So everything that works in a wet environment, from a wet lab point of view, works in the kitchen. 
So this is really probably the most successful and most popular thing. Sous vide cooking is being done in a lot of high-end restaurants, definitely here in New York, per se. There's a bunch of plenty of others. You know, I don't know where you guys are from, but most likely your hometown, there's at least a couple of restaurants that are using this technique for cooking. Uh, uh, let's see, a little video of eggs cooking. I mean, it just kind of shows you there's a little agitation in the water. It kind of mixes the water up so that you don't get this heat gradient. Um, it works not just in eggs, but also works in steak. So this is kind of an exaggerated photograph of a normal piece of steak that's been cooked, just pan searing it. Uh, you'll see there's this really nice, you know, gradient of done. It's kind of this bullseye thing where the middle's like rare and the outside's like kind of well done. Yeah? <laughs> I heard this one person going, yeah, mm, am I making you hungry? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the same thing for steak is true as with eggs. There's this really narrow range where meat's actually really, really good. 122 degrees, one protein in meat, uh, myosin begins to denature and change texture. Around 150 degrees, there's another protein called actin that also denatures and changes texture. Uh, for really no particular reason other than just sheer dumb luck, we happen to prefer when myosin is denatured and cooked and actin's native, which ends up being, from a food science point of view, kind of in this 140 to 153 degree Fahrenheit temperature range. And if you're thinking, hey, that lines up with medium rare steak, you're absolutely right. Um, Medium rare steak is pretty much, you know, in that ideal band. Uh, let's see. So there's a little gradient done in this chart. Kind of shows you roughly, you know, you under normal circumstances when you cook things, you know, heat goes in from the outside in, and the outside eventually gets hotter than the ideal temperature because in most cooking environments, the environment's actually hotter than your target temperature. But when you go to something sous vide, like the piece on the right, what you get is just this one entire block of meat that's medium rare or whatever you set the temperature to. Um, so the whole thing is like this amazing texture, amazing flavor, really good texture. Just it, it's great. Um, now, of course, you know you notice the piece on the left side has this nice brown crust on the outside, and the piece on the right kind of got this kind of gray matted look that's not so good looking. Yeah. So what we do in cooking this stuff is after actually sous vide cooking it, you take it out and you drop it into a pan and you sear it really quickly just get to get that outside nice and browned up. Uh, yeah. So these are my friends Ed and Jamie, and what they're doing is they're taking a piece of meat putting it into a vacuum bag and sealing it. And the reason this is done for sous vide stuff is it prevents the water from coming into chemical contact with that food. The water is only about heat transfer. It's just about getting energy into the system. It's not about actually like, you know, doing anything with the meat. So by sealing it in a plastic bag, what you get is something where, you know, any flavors aren't getting washed away essentially. It's also a lot easier to work with, frankly. I mean, a piece of steak floating in water is kind of vaguely gross. Um, so that's what it looks like uncooked. That's what it looks like cooked. And that's just a little photo of me, you know, pan searing a piece of meat. Um, you can do other things. Fish works really well, lobster works really well. Um, you can actually seal other stuff in that bag. So for the lobster, um, I actually did it in this um, butter water mixture. So, you know, the lobster itself, you know, imagine that shell trying to get it vacuum sealed, like that just would be impossible. But if you put other stuff into the mixture, um, you can like do marinades or whatever else. So this whole thing is sous vide stuff. Um, you know, it started out with industrial controllers, which are really pricey. You know, they're kind of in the $1,000 territory, which is just insane for somebody at home. Um, there's a company called Sous Vide that came out with this unit called the Sous Vide Supreme this last year. Um, it's about $400, but, you know, we can still do, say what? Supreme? Su oh, S-O-U-S-V-I-D-E. Two words. You own one? Who said that? You're the same guy that said, yeah, earlier. I do too. I mean, th these things are great. I mean, you have, you have no idea how amazing it is. I mean, like Trader Joe's sells fish vacuum packed in bags with marinade in it. It's like it can't get any easier. You take the bag, you drop it in the water, and you go to the gym or go for a walk. I mean, thinking about that curve with the ideal temperature, the water's not hotter than that, so it can't overcook. So you can just let it sit in there for like an extra half hour. So like from a timing point of view, as long as it's been in there long enough to actually cook, it's good. So it's like, yeah, this stuff's great. I mean, it's, it's so easy. It's like, go, trust me, try it. Um, you can make your own rig. You can go buy a J-Love controller and drop a thermocouple into like a crock pot, just interpose on the power. Make sure you get a dumb crock pot, one that you, know, you can switch on, that doesn't then like decide to turn off and not turn back on if you cut the power. You know what I mean? So you can do that for like 70 or $80, which is you know, kind of in the realm of, hey, I actually am willing to go try and, and do that. Um, and it's, it's definitely worth it. So that's just a really quick primer kind of on sous vide stuff. Um, more generally though, w why do we cook? What's the actual purpose of cooking? I mean, it's kind of nutritional stuff. There is, you know, some amount of it tastes better from a textural point of view. Um, but the real question is, like, why learn to cook? 
why do we actually want to go into the kitchen when, like, say here in New York, you know, it's practically cheaper to go down the street and buy something from, like, Picante or whatever, and it's going to be really good and cost you, like, $7. So, you know, think about the reasons why you cook. I mean, why do you guys like to cook or want to learn to cook? Because you have a girlfriend. Okay. What else? It's fun. Meditative. Dietary, you get to choose. We don't live in New York. Where do you live? Toledo, Ohio. You so want sous vide, man. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Um, you get to buy knives. Well, you can do that without cooking. You just, you know, have knives. Um, so there's this kind of nice little simple model about cooking. You can think about it as inputs. These are your ingredients, things you actually go and buy at the store. Cooking is the actual bit of, you know, I'm going to change this thing. I'm going to slice it, do some chemical, physical modifications, blah, blah, blah. Sensations are like how it smells, how it tastes, kind of, you know, what the objective, everyone would agree, that thing is pink, for example. And there's kind of perceptions. And these will be things like your emotional reaction to it. Hey, this reminds me of my childhood, or my grandmother's brownies tasted like this. Um, so there's this researcher down at Cornell, a guy named Brian Wansink, who did this study of about a thousand cooks, asked them a bunch of questions, did this K-means cluster analysis, and came up with this really nice little typology of like five types of cooks. And it actually turns out to be really kind of fascinatingly useful. Because when I'm talking to somebody about why they cook, I can pretty quickly go, oh, you're like this type of person. And he really kindly developed this five-question quiz, which I just so happen to have. So the way this works, um, I'm going to run through each of the five questions. Just keep track of which letter you're answering. So if there's, fi there's five questions. So if you answered, say, A on all five, then you're type A. It's like not that difficult. So you don't even have to write it down. But you can if you want. Um, so you guys ready? Okay. When I cook a meal, I typically dot, dot, dot. Are we good? Should I go on? Anyone going to say no? Okay, that was a dumb question. <laughs> Some of my favorite ingredients are if none of the above, um, then just don't count that letter. Um, so when he did the research, he only actually fit like 80% of the population. And like some people just are like this hybrid blend between different types. So I mean, like don't take this as like, oh my god, I am this type. I have never like, you know, it's not, it's not exact. Next one, ready? Okay. In my free time, I like to, okay, well for this crowd, um, there's probably like an F, which is like. <laughs> work with me here, people. Wait, what? Yeah, okay, okay, it, just answer D. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite things to cook are, no soldering iron references here, please. You don't cook junk food. <laughs> junk food's like extruded. It's like, doesn't... Okay, are we ready? Other people describe me as... I should go through the slides and edit them and add type F at the end, which is like, next hope it's indie. <laughs> okay, so everyone kind of had a chance to get their letters down, figure out what you are, drum roll. Okay, so here are the types. So um, giving, this is somebody who like, you know, shows nurturing and affection through like baking and taking it to their work or, you know, whatever. Um, healthy, this is somebody who like, you know, brown rice, veggies, fish, steamed stuff, and like could care less about, you know, how it looks or how it tastes. Methodical, this is somebody who like, you know, can make it look just like the picture, but like their kitchen will look like a nuclear bomb has gone off, but like it'll look just like the picture. Um, innovative, this is somebody, you know, reads a couple of recipes, goes into the kitchen, goes, hmm, yeah, I'm going to try this instead, and you know, either it comes out or it doesn't, but they're happy with it. Or they're not and they don't care. Uh, and then the last type is competitive, you know, intense perfectionists. People who like to grill generally fall into that category. Not that there's anything wrong with grilling. I like to grill too. Um, so just a show of hands. Um, who is A? B? C? D? <laughs> e? So the interesting thing is the general population is like 20% for each of these. <laughs> so here we have scientific proof that you guys are not like the rest of the people out there. 
So going back to that little chart earlier, you can kind of roughly map that type onto what your motivations are. So for me, like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a blend between 